I'd like to share some of the projects we're doing too as time allows. So uh, here are, uh, let's see, advance this. Not advancing, let's see here. There we go. Uh, here are my disclosures. And first of all, I just want you to, to start focusing on what we're gonna talk about and, and maybe try to pay attention and uh, not, di not to get distracted with other things. So uh, we'll start with the introduction and then uh, we'll talk about evaluating patients, exam, uh, history, et cetera. I wanna go through some concepts of the way we do surgery, what we think about, and then uh, focus on surgical technique to include a video I put together that, that shows uh, uh, our technique that we're currently doing. And then uh, we'll talk about rehabilitation and that's appropriate for this audience. And uh, I'd also like to share some uh, uh, slides from uh, uh, Joe Hart, who was nice enough to share this with me. I'll, I'll give him a shout out when we get to that point. We've done a lot of work. He's doing a lot of work uh, uh, with uh, uh, other uh, uh, co-investigators on returning to play. And we'll share some of his slides. And then as time allows, uh, we'll talk about revision ACL, pediatric ACL, and our ACL research. Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll have time to do that. So first of all, uh, ACL injuries are pretty common, about one per 3,000. There's 95,000 new injuries a year and 50,000 reconstructions every year in the United States. And really it boils down to, especially in skiers, those who have torn their ACLs and those who haven't. And so the two bundle concept has been popularized by Freddie Fu, but others have described that before him, including Palmer, Abbott, and Gurgis. So there's actually two bundles an anterior medial and posterior lateral. The anterior medial bundle and posterior lateral bundles have different lengths and they have a broad insertion. You can see here, uh, and we're used to looking at this as surgeons in 90 degrees of flexion, and you can see where these uh, tunnels originate and insert, uh, both on the femur on the top and the tibia on the bottom. And when you go to flexion, they actually cross. So ACL is the primary restraint to anterior translation, and it has the secondary restraints that include menisci, hamstrings, and other ligaments. So the ACL is important for anterior translation. It also is the proprioceptive sensory organ of the knee, and so it has a Purkinje fibers that are important for sensation. It has viscoelastic properties that allows it to be flexible, and there's a complex array arrangement of uh, fibers, as we have alluded to. So the classic injury is a non-contact pivoting injury and the patella dislocation sometimes gets confused with this because it's the great mimicker. And as we all know, the female athletes have a four to five times increased risk of injury. So moving on to examination, the Lachman is the gold standard. It's done in 20 or 30 degrees of knee flexion. You simply stabilize the femur and pull forward on the tibia. I like to put a pillow under the knee because it really helps you to get the patient to relax. A pivot shift is also very helpful and this uh, really uh, calls out the importance of the rotatory function of the ACL and it's best elicited on exam under anesthesia. It's also important to look for range of motion. We want to make sure that you have full extension otherwise you can have a locked knee and we'll often send people to you guys, a therapist, to help us get the motion before we do the surgery. That's what we call prehab, and it's critical that patients have knee motion before surgery, because if they go into the surgery with the loss of extension, they may never get it back again. So that's why the prehab is so important. And it's also important for all of us to know about all the other exams, because sometimes there are concurrent injuries to the MCL or the posterior lateral corner or the PCL, and you can get fooled if you don't do a thorough exam. So here's an example of the Lachman where we pull forward on the tibia. This is an example of external rotation asymmetry on the right knee, which has a combined posterior lateral corner injury. Here's the Lachman, stabilize the femur and pull forward on the tibia. This is a pretty remarkable Lachman under anesthesia. Here's the pivot shift, valgus stress, and as we push the knee into flexion, it, it subluxes. 
So after the exam, you can confirm, uh, you need to get radiographs anyway to look for associated injuries. You can also see avulsion fractures, sagon fracture, which is a chip fracture, or a lateral capsular sign, and even tibia plateau fractures. Of course, we always get MRIs, especially because they're highly sensitive and specific, show us this bone bruise is classically seen, and also helps us to rule out other injuries, like to the menisci. A CAT scan is helpful also, particularly in revision ACL, to look for osteolysis, which we'll get into in some detail later. So here's an example of the Sagon fracture. It's kind of subtle, but you can see that little fleck off the, um, the lateral uh, tibia, and that uh, is associated with the ALL injury. Also somewhat subtle is the deep sulcus sign. You can see that the sulcus, which is a normal structure, is actually deeper here uh, because uh, the injury that happened with the pivot shift phenomenon. And then of course, if you had a previous ACL reconstruction, you can critically look at other tunnels. Obviously this femoral tunnel is crazy anterior. Now the bone bruise is where the lateral femoral condyle and the tibia plateau on the lateral side actually impact each other and cause this phenomenon, which we now know as a bone bruise. And this is what actually happens. Here's a radiograph demonstrating what happens when you create that bone bruise, because when you tear your ACL, you will often have a subluxation or a dislocation of the knee that spontaneously reduces. Then you can objectively measure your laxity with a KT-1000. The only difference between a KT-1000 and 2000 is the 2000 has a little printout. The problem with the KT is that it requires relaxation, and if you use the manual maximum, which is preferred, it's variable depending upon how hard you pull on it. And remember that laxity doesn't necessarily connote instability, because some people have baseline laxity. So the natural history of ACL uh, has been debated over the years. Uh, the arthritis issue uh, is still unresolved somewhat because uh, the issue is that you can't tell patients you need to get an ACL to avoid arthritis because there's a lot of controversy about that. What you do know is that meniscal tears and cartilage injuries increase with time. And those injuries, if they're not addressed, can lead to arthritis as well. So there is uh, meniscus and cartilage injuries known to increase with time. So there are some authors that advocate for non-operative uh, treatment, especially over in Europe. Uh, and they said at five years, they had similar outcomes. The problem is people in the United States aren't willing to wait this long recovery, and they don't want to risk having a non-functional knee, particularly if you're an athlete. So we try to select patients who are young, at least physiologically young. They, if they're active, and nowadays our patients are very active, even well into their 50s and 60s. Uh, <clears throat> now they have, have it, usually have it, they've been very active prior to their injury. They want to get back to their activities. So uh, that's, that's a reasonable patient to select, especially those with increased laxity. So the timing uh, is somewhat controversial. There's different rules if you live on a ski slope versus here in the, at, at sea level, uh, but it's important to regain the motion and get your quad tone back and get your effusion under control. Those three things are what are critical. And that's what the therapists help us to help do that before we do surgery. That's what prehab's all about to get our quad back, to get our full motion, and to get our effusion under control. Now, if you have a locked knee like this bucket handle shown here, then you may want to do it a little sooner. We had a case today where we had a locked bucket handle, and uh, that made that a tier two case. Here's the ACL native. So how do you reconstruct the ACL in 2020? There's lots of ideas, there's lots of techniques, but they're not all right and you certainly don't want to be practicing on your patients. So we, as surgeons, have an obligation to study and to follow this and to evolve and develop our techniques uh, as we get more and more information. And the current uh, approach is to try to get an anatomic ACL reconstruction. And whether that's a two-bundle reconstruction or a one-bundle in the center of those two bundles, it's important to try to restore the anatomy. So over the years, we used to do extra articular reconstructions and repairs and didn't always work out so well. And then in the 1990s, we went to um, a uh, two incision or a trans approach. Again, that didn't work out so well. 
in the 2000s, uh, injury prevention, uh, allografts were very popular. And again, those didn't work out very well. And then finally, we evolved to a more anatomic ACL reconstruction and decelerated rehabilitation. So the whole concept of trying to get people back faster was probably erroneous. And as we share some uh, of the research going on uh, with uh, Joe Hart and his colleagues, you'll understand that a little better. We also have learned to focus on different things that we never thought about, like slope of the tibia and like whether you need to augment the ACL reconstruction. And some advocate for ACL repair like we did in the 70s, but I'm not so sure that's a good idea. So there are several questions like tourniquet use, what kind of graft, what's the minimum size, how much tunnel length, how much, uh, what angle you place things in there, where do you reference the different tunnels, how do you fix it, and how many bundles, just to name a few. So we'll go through some of these. The tourniquet uh, has no long-term effects, but it can have some short-term inhibition of muscle recovery. And you may see that in your therapy offices when you're uh, rehabbing and post-op patients. Sometimes they get bruising and uh, pain. And so we try, we still use tourniquet, most of us, but we want to try to minimize the amount we use there. Graft selection has evolved. Synthetics were tried initially with uh, abysmal failure rates. Allografts were real popular, but we realized that those have fail high failure rates also. Again, four to five times the amount of failures in the West Point study. So allografts are just not a good idea, especially for younger people. They can have disease transmission, infection, and they just don't work. So most of us have migrated to using autograft. And there's three autographs that are commonly used, patella tendon, hamstring, and quadriceps. Quadriceps are regionally uh, 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 adapted and, and there's, there's pockets that really like quadriceps. Most of us, I would say, still use patella tendon, especially in younger patients. And quadriceps uh, or uh, quad hamstrings are still a reasonable choice as well, but probably not in younger people or people with uh, increased laxity. The problem with patella tendon, as we all know, is there's a risk of anterior knee pain, particularly with squatting or kneeling. And if you're not careful, you can get a patella fracture. The all, so those are two drawbacks. You can minimize that by really packing bone graft into the, uh, the harvest site and being real careful with your harvest. You also can have a mismatch with the length of the tunnel. And so it's sticking out of the tunnel rather than right at the margin. And it's hard to fix it when you do that. You can also plan different tunnel lengths based upon uh, preparing for that ahead of time. Patella tendon does incorporate better, and, and some studies have shown also that it's a little bit tighter of a graft, uh, so that's why we like it in the young people. And bone-to-bone -bone healing, which you can get with the uh, patella tendon, is, is a positive thing. So hamstrings are still popular also, uh, particularly uh, for uh, middle-aged folks, uh, and uh, they can be associated, however, with tunnel expansion. Uh, they may have a higher revision rate, uh, and it's, it's important to get uh, a appropriate size width. Quad tendons, again, are becoming very popular. They're good for revisions also. Uh, we use them for revisions. We have not adopted them as primary usually, but that's a good choice for a lot of people. So as I talked about, there is a minimum size that you need for your hamstrings, at least eight millimeters or even 8.5 millimeters uh, in order to have a good success. And uh, there are uh, things you can do to help with that. But the, the problem is you don't want to get too big of a graft uh, because uh, you can also have problems with that. So too small of a graft, as shown by the researchers shown here at Duke, uh, had a higher failure rate. Too big of a graft, can cause uh, complications such as what Brian Warner and I showed where we had a Hoffa fracture that, that we try to get a tunnel too big. So one of the other technical considerations of ACL reconstruction is tunnel placement. The most common cause of failure of ACL reconstruction is a femoral tunnel that's placed too anterior. And so this graphic shows very nicely what happens if you don't place your tunnel in the correct location. So, the middle graph, the middle of uh, both pictures, the middle tendon is the appropriate location and it has isometricity both in extension and flexion. The anterior graft is loose in extension, which is something you don't want, and tight in flexion. A posterior graft 
is tight in extension and loose in flexion. So you want to get that happy medium. So uh, this has been studied and uh, some folks think you can get uh, trans tibial location, which actually uh, is not so good. The circle shows the trans tibial location and you really want to be between the red and the yellow uh, circles shown in this illustration. And we've studied this also in our lab. We did extensive CT works when Dr. Tompkins uh, was here as a fellow. Uh, Joe Hart participated in this as others did too. And we actually did high grade CT scans and looked at the femoral tunnel insertion. And you can see that blue dot is where the tunnel inserts. And then we studied whether you could get there with a transtibial versus an anatomic. Now anatomic is done either through an accessory medial portal, which is one option, or a flexible reamer, which is another option, or outside in. But you can't get an anatomic reconstruction with a transtibial technique. At least that's what our research has shown. So some people are still uh, transtibial fans, but we showed that you can't get consistently in the footprint when you do transtibial reconstruction. So there are also uh, different techniques, and we show that if you place these more horizontally and use independent tunnel placement, you can get better uh, overlap with the native tunnel. But some people still argue you can do this, and uh, so I, I think that probably most of us have gone over to anatomic independent femoral tunnel drilling. This is becoming more and more popular and uh, the independent tunnel drilling is really the way to go. So the other thing we found in a cadaver study is when you do transtibial uh, drilling, you expand the tibial tunnel and that's not necessarily a good thing. So you don't want an oval tunnel either in primary or revision ACLs. So we found that uh, we want to get to the right spot and the best way to do this uh, is not with a transtibial but with an independent tunnel drilling. We did a study here at UVA and uh, we did 100 consecutive ACLs uh, with anterior medial drilling uh, and we found that the length is fine and that was one of the criticisms early on of doing an independent anterior medial portal was you get too short of graft. Well, if you hyperflex the knee, that doesn't happen and you're just fine. And it consistently be, can, not, can be, not be done with transtibial, but these three options, which we already mentioned, are the way to go with independent drilling and anatomic femoral tunnel placement. So the way you do it from accessory medial portal, uh, portal is to mark your spot and do that at 90 degrees because it really gets disorienting once you get it up into hyperflexion. Once you put your pin in, then you can uh, check it and over drill it and get an anatomic reconstruction. So uh, two incisions, also a very reasonable option. We do this in peds cases all the time. So there's two camps that are still remain and the double bundle camp is really falling out of favor, but both of those allow you to get a more anatomic reconstruction and really what it does is restores the pivot. So we also have to think about different things, including the amount of graft in the tunnel and how to fix things. And, and there's evolving studies on this, uh, this uh, technique. So we now have talked about the femoral tunnel and the tibial tunnel has really uh, been kind of the forgotten uh, child here. And so we've started doing research about the tibial tunnel. And so uh, BD has shown that if you get a tibial tunnel more anteriorly, that it, it allows a better strength and better uh, function biomechanically than a posterior tunnel. So he had the case for a more anterior tunnel. This other surgeon from uh, Japan also advocated for a more anterior tunnel and found that he had better translation, uh, a KT of 1.4 versus 3.0, when you put a more anterior tunnel. And our research has shown the same thing. So there was some question about whether if you do a, uh, 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 a independent a tunnel drilling, whether you can have roof impingement. 
And so we did a study here radiographically showing that the transtibial ACL reconstruction with the anterior placement can cause roof impingement. But if you do an anatomic reconstruction with an accessory media portal, you don't have that roof impingement because the graft never crosses Blumenstadt's line. It stays below it. It doesn't have to go along that roof as you do when you do a transtibial reconstruction. Now fixation is the weak link early on, so we like to have secure fixation, and this includes the use of interference screws or various uh, cortical fixation devices. This is the weak link early on. This is why some surgeons want you to slow down your rehab early on. But if you have good fixation, you're okay. Uh, numerous trials have shown single bundle, double bundle, and there's, uh, most people have abandoned the double bundle concept because it may work better in the lab, but it's not worth the hassle in clinic. And so uh, there's different ways to do this, but the key concept here is that you want to restore the normal anatomy. And so restoring your normal anatomy uh, means that you try to place the tunnel not with the transtibial shown in the red here, uh, and uh, not all the way anterior, but ideally somewhere in the middle or double bundle on those two on the right. We want to restore the normal ACL. Now you also need to fix other injuries. Meniscus tears, we have to repair them whenever they can because uh, meniscus tears can cause arthritis down the line. So we always try to save the meniscus whenever possible. Also, there may be articular injuries you need to fix, uh, concurrent injuries to other ligaments that need to be repaired or reconstructed. And uh, we need to address all of those factions. Now, how do we know whether we did a good job with ACL? Well, there, there, there's no, no great gold standard, but I would suggest to you that the best standard is return to play. And that's why I think that uh, Dr. Hart's research uh, and Dr. Bodkin, who's just got his PhD, uh, also have helped us tremendously and we're starting to make us think about this better. So the problem is you can only measure the translation in an AP. You can't measure a pivot shift. Well, you can, but it's not available commercially yet. So in 2020, what's out is isometric uh, reconstruction, transtibial techniques, functional braces, and what's in is a more anatomic reconstruction that focuses on patient reported outcomes and injury prevention. So now I'm gonna show a video that we uh, have uh, about ACL reconstruction technique. And Winston, pipe in if, if the, uh, the video is gonna show in a minute, we'll pipe in if the video doesn't uh, have sounds, I'll just, I'll just talk over it. So graphs, either patella tendon or hamstring, positioning, I like this bracketed knee holder to hyperflex the knee, Femoral tunnel, anatomic, more horizontal. And landmarks. I like to take radiographs during my ACL reconstructions because I want the femoral tunnel about three quarters of the way across Blumenstadt's line and below Blumenstadt's line. And I like to have the tibial tunnel just in front of where that upslope of the eminence is, which is about 35% of the way across. Here it is shown arthroscopically. And there's various techniques you can do to get to restore tunnel length to make sure that you don't have the graft sticking out of the, of the tunnel. That's a bummer when you get to that point and almost done with the case and you have a graft sticking out. So I told you where I like to have my uh, landmarks. We can argue about that. Uh, and then fixation with interference screws. Uh, hamstrings is various different options and you can back up things if you have any questions. Anatomic ACL so can you hear this, Winston? In this video, we'll discuss techniques for hamstring, patella tendon, revision, and femoral physal sparing ACL reconstruction using an anatomic approach. We begin with an exam under anesthesia. This is the Lachman and the pivot shift, both demonstrating an ACL deficient knee. A bracketed leg holder is used. The knee can be flexed and hyperflexed for this procedure. The portals are planned, including an accessory medial portal. The hamstring harvest is at a location between five and seven centimeters distal to the medial joint. The incision is carried down to subcutaneous tissues. 
and the hamstring tendons are identified, and a Penrose drain is placed in each tendon. The uh, dissection is carried down to the insertion, and a whip stitch is placed in each tendon. I like to use two different sutures, a number two for the gracilis and a number five for the semitendinosus. All soft tissue dissections are freed up and the tendons are harvested and taken to the back table for preparation. The muscle is stripped off the tendon and the matching whip stitch is placed in the free end. The tendons are then sized to fit through appropriate size tunnel and a vicral suture is used to secure the tendon and to limit the graft abrasion during future femoral tunnel fixation. The graft is kept under tension for the balance of the case. The central eight centimeters are uh, whip stitched in this fashion. The diagnostic arthroscopy is carried out through standard portals and the ACL injury is identified. The residual ACL is debrided using a combination of a basket and a shaver. An accessory medial portal is in place, approximately one to two centimeters medial and one centimeter distal to the medial portal. While viewing through the standard medial portal, the accessory medial portal is used to plan the femoral tunnel. This location is about two thirds to three quarters of the way from front to back in the notch. A microfracture awl is used to plan the tunnel location and a beef needle is placed in the center uh, of this area while the knee is hyperflexed. The beef needle is then drilled through the cortex and a partially threaded drill bit is used over this wire. Note that we use a sheath to protect the medial femoral condyle prior to drilling. The femoral tunnel is drilled to a depth of about 30 millimeters and debris is removed. We then use the beef needle to pass a passing suture into the tunnel. The knee is taken out of hyperflexion and tibial tunnel drilling proceeds. The ideal location for the tibial tunnel is centered along a line from the posterior aspect of the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. After pin placement is confirmed, it is over drilled using an appropriately sized drill bit. Debris is removed and the pre-placed passing suture is retrieved through the tibial tunnel. The graft is then taken from the back table and secured on a safety net on the drapes and then used to pass the graft into the knee. Sometimes a right angle is used to make sure this difficult turn can be negotiated easily. Once the graft is passed into the femoral tunnel, it is fixed using an aperture fixation device. This allows the two bundles to be separated at their insertion. A sheath is placed into the tunnel and an interference screw is placed into the sheath. Note that the medial femoral condyle is protected throughout these steps. The tibial side is then fixed with a similar device. Tension is placed in the sutures and the knee is cyclically loaded.
Again, a sheath and a screw is placed with tension on the device. This patient now has a stable knee. Residual tendon can be excised and the wounds closed. The patella tendon autograft reconstruction is similar. The tendon is harvested, including a central one-third of the tendon. An oscillating saw is used to harvest the graft and an osteotome is used in order to retrieve the graft. On the patellar side, it's important not to make a real wide graft. I have found that a bovie can be helpful with these initial cuts and a 15 blade at the top of the cut. No more than 20 millimeter bone plugs are necessary. When harvesting the patella tendon, it's important to use care to not go beyond 10 millimeters or pass too far past the cortex. The graft is taken to the back table for preparation. The bone plugs are trimmed to 20 millimeters each and sized to fit in the appropriate size tunnels. Compression pliers can be helpful in graft preparation. Passing sutures are used with one on the femoral side and two perpendicular sutures on the tibial side. The graft is tensioned on the back table. The other steps for ACL reconstruction are similar to the hamstring. Following tibial guide pin placement, the soft tissues are dissected around this guide pin in order to harvest the bone graft from the tibial tunnel preparation. Bone graft is harvested from the tunnel and from the fluted drill bit. This bone graft is ideal for placement in the patella at the end of the case. The graft then is passed with the pre-placed passing suture. Again, a right angle can be helpful in negotiating this curve and to ensure that the graft is oriented correctly. A half round rasp is also helpful in securing the final graft passage. An interference screw is placed with the sheath as before to protect the medial femoral condyle. Here we note final graft placement of the patella tendon autograft. The tibial side is fixed with an interference screw as well. It's important to initially place this screw somewhat horizontally until it seeks its path. Bone graft is placed in the patella tendon defect. If any is left over, it's also placed in the tibia and the wounds closed in standard fashion. Revision ACL reconstruction utilizes the tendon that wasn't used previously. This is a previous case of a patella tendon graft that was placed somewhat vertically. We therefore plan to use a hamstring autograft. Again, the steps are similar, but we'll point out the differences. In this case, a notch plasty is accomplished to remove the notch regrowth. This allows us to get to the over the top position. We debris tissue from the previous tunnel and address the location of the previous tunnel to see if it's adequate or if it's in the way of our planned tunnel. This femoral tunnel is not an ideal location. And therefore, we will plan to bone graft this using a one stage approach. We place a dilator in the tunnel and over drill a beef pin, centering this in the previous tunnel. We then over drill the tunnel to an appropriate size to eliminate all soft tissue. We drill it to the depth of our planned bone graft. We use a dowel bone graft and place it into the previous tunnel. The uh, tip of the bone graft is bulleted and a 332nd wire is placed in its base. 
This popsicle stick approach allows us to put the dowel into the previous tunnel. A cannulated tamp or a dilator can be used to place the dowel into the tunnel. A notch plastic can then be accomplished, including the dowel, and the new femoral tunnel can be placed in the planned location without worrying about the previous tunnel. I use an eight millimeter offset guide as described by noise for locating the femoral tunnel. The offset guide is placed in the over the top position and the center of the revised femoral tunnel is planned. We then drill our femoral tunnel as described previously and the tibial tunnel as we previously described and check our location under fluoroscopy. Note that this pin is about 40% of the way back from anterior to posterior and in the center of the notch. The tibial tunnel is then drilled as previously described. It's important to look up the tunnel to make sure that you have reasonable bone graft in that tunnel. Again, the sheath and screw are placed as described previously and the graft is secured likewise in the tibia. The fixation of the tibia side can also be backed up, which is a... Okay, so that's, uh, sorry for that delay. I think we, we've seen enough of that. I wanted to make sure you saw both hamstring and patella tendon. So post-op management, this is where you guys come in. So we wanna work on immediate post-op range of motion, emphasizing extension. I like to actually make sure they have a pillow under their heel, not their knee, but their heel, even in the recovery room. And so the nurses always try to make them more comfortable and put the pillow under their knee. And, and we always emphasize extension. So we also use a brace if there's meniscus uh, repairs. Uh, and we also do partial weight bearing if there's meniscus repairs. So I'm not a big advocate of a brace if, unless you have a meniscus repair. They can return to light duty or clerical work in two weeks. And uh, they can start running in about three months. But this uh, all depends on how they're doing with their studies and with their return to play criteria. Now, return to sport, there's the question. We'd like to get at least 85% strength and function, and we like to have good test results. We used to say six months, I just changed this slide today to say nine months, and sometimes even longer. Functional braces really don't have a place here. We'd studied this when I was at the Air Force Academy, and uh, really there's no efficacy for braces Functional braces and a lot of patients still like them, but they really haven't been proven to be efficacious. So now, I hope that I don't mess up Joe Hart here. He was kind enough to give me these slides and I appreciate that. I wanna just go over a few of the findings that he had uh, in, in these slides. And this is important because you will always hear about the leap tests and the step tests that they developed. So here's a healthy knee with near 100% strength of the quadriceps. Here is an ACL reconstruction at six months, and you can see those bar graphs where they're markedly diminished compared to the healthy functional patient. The left is close to 100%, the right one has significant weakness. Uh, here we see that the vast majority of the patients, uh, here this is a, another test where we have better results, but still some deficits. And you can see that most of the patients that uh, we collected were ACL reconstructions, but there's a few other ones just to work as controls and with hip problems, et cetera. Now, the ACL pass rate is not as high as we would expect. In fact, people usually fail because of really poor strength with the quadriceps. And interestingly, they, they, they do okay with the jump test, especially athletes but they really lag behind with their extension strength. And this is where we see it, it's so discouraging for these people because you can almost guarantee every one of them is gonna have poor uh, strength, except for the people that go to the training room every single day. So Dr. Hart and his colleagues were able to collect these patients and we found a re-injury rate of about 20%. Uh, which is, which is kind of high and we're not really, uh, we'd like to reduce that. You can see that this is especially a problem uh, with, with females and hamstring uh, reconstructions. So the hamstring strength 
recovery uh, is also uh, uh, deficient. Uh, the quad tendon weakness is common with patients in with the patella tendon grafts and hamstring patients in patients with hamstring grafts, especially in females. Now, these charts here, I had to, to get some extra instruction from Dr. Hart to figure out what the heck this is. He called these uh, violin grafts. And what it basically shows from what I understand is that the scores do improve, but not consistently uh, from six months to nine months. But there's still a lot of people who lag behind. They have pretty sad violins. So the bottom line is that these testings are showing us that you need to test at least two months apart and you need to continue to test until they meet satisfactory criteria. Now, the, the investigators have also shown that after a successful step test, we can go to the leap test. You step before you leap. And the helpful thing of the leap test is this also gives you some functional testing. So this is uh, important for allowing us to determine a return to play. And uh, th th this shows the uh, progression uh, with the step and the leap test. So four months we do a step test, six months a leap test, and many, many, many times we have to do a leap test again or delay the leap test because of poor step testing. So this has been very, very valuable uh, uh, data. It, it's almost uh, discouraging to see these results come into your inbox because you go, is anybody ever get good quadricep strength? And the answer is very few, but it helps us to, to tell patients from the get-go that we expect this and we want them to improve. So this is continuing to help us and really help us manage our patients. So hats off, Dr. Hart and Dr. Budkins and other uh, researchers. So let's move on to injury prevention. Injury prevention uh, can include uh, jump testing and landing testing. We wanna teach, uh, especially our female athletes to land in more flexion and less valgus. Skier prevention works for advanced skiers, but not for beginners. And uh, so this hasn't been that helpful. The challenges began include revision ACLs, one bundle injury, PEDS ACLs, and combined procedures. Again, emphasizing the, the need to find concurrent injuries, uh, to be concerned about these other non-anatomic problems, and avoid complications. Again, don't miss the posterior lateral quarter injury. This time, the, the left foot shows external rotation asymmetry associated with the posterior lateral quarter injury. Be prepared, use fluoro if you need to, back it up. Uh, a vertical graft shouldn't be replaced with another vertical graft. You need to have uh, lots of equipment when you do revisions. We showed you that plug technique. The plug technique's been very helpful for us. Sometimes we can do one stage, sometimes we have to do two stage. And we've actually developed some instruments to help with this. And the one thing about revision is important is to back it up. So tie over posts or buttons and, and use more than one fixation whenever you need to. And revision ACL is not as good as primary ACLs. And there's a group called the uh, MARS group, which is a multi-center ACL revision study. And they show that the, they're not as good. And so we have to counsel our patients on that. Here's an example of a patient uh, with injured their knee playing soccer. You can see this ACL tear. You can see that this is just a single bundle tear. So there's just one bundle that's torn, the other is intact. So in this case, we were able to revise this with just one bundle and leave the other bundle intact. It's technically difficult to do. And then with kids, it's a whole nother thing. You need to be aware that kids are a different population and you want to avoid their physis, their growth plates. And so we've studied this and, and come up with techniques to do this uh, it, because most of the graft comes across the femur. You want to avoid these growth plates. Again, the growth is important. You can determine how much growth is remaining based upon uh, bone ages and plan accordingly. You don't want to cross the physis. 
because you can get ang angular deformities if you do that. So we avoid growth disturbance at all costs and try to be very careful about planting our tunnels in kids. You really can't ask kids to modify their activities because they don't listen to you. That happens until they're well into their 20s. So you need to do different techniques. Activity modification doesn't work. You can't primary repair, and we'll see if that other techniques that are being developed in Boston have some enhanced healing. You can fix divulsion fractures. Uh, here you see uh, such a case. You can either use sutures or screws or both. Here's an avulsion fracture. You can see it on these radiographs. And we fixed this one by debriding this, passing sutures, uh, fixing it down to its bed with sutures, and then adding a screw on top of that, avoiding the growth plane. So you can also do extra articular uh, reconstructions for people who are very young or over the top procedures. You can also try to uh, avoid the physis by going over the top with these various procedures that have been described. Here's an example of the over the top, an 11 year old boy I did several years ago. Graph goes over the top, which is really not anatomic. You see, now look where the screw is and look what happens five years later. The screws migrate, it's amazing how that happens. You can do all epiphyseal reconstructions uh, here's an example of that in a nine-year-old football player. You can see here there's not a lot of room to place that pin, but you can sneak it through the epiphysis and do an ACL reconstruction that technique. It, it spares both growth plates. Here's that case later. Uh, you can also, for as patients get older, you can do a very central tibial tunnel and spare the physis on the femur. Here's an example of that. This is a kid uh, injured in football practice. Here's his growth plate still open. Here's the ACL injury. Here we are placing our pins uh, very central in the tibia, and therefore we have less growth disturbance because it's not eccentric. And the femur we stayed all with below the growth plate. And there is our fixation. So this patient had no problems. We followed him to maturity. And here, four years later, we took some hardware out and you can see a very nice graph. Don't do a, a conventional reconstruction in a peds because you will injure the growth plate. So we're coming to the end. I want to just talk about the peds a minute. So the bottom line is it depends upon their age and their growth remaining. So if they're really young, you need to totally avoid the physis. Uh, if they're older, you can do this technique with the below the physis and the femur and across the transtibial the tibia, tibia. And as they get older, you can do more anatomic or uh, adult procedures. So I want to uh, not stop here because I want to leave time for questions. There's a bunch of research we've done, uh, but I, I'm not gonna share it at this point because it's a little too technical for this whole audience and we're still doing some of these studies. They're still underway. So I wanted to leave some time for questions. I, I do appreciate uh, your attention, and I hope I didn't bore anybody. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, any questions? There is also the chat. All, you guys can also ask questions via the chat feature as well. That's quite comprehensive, Dr. Miller. What have you changed over the course of your career since when you started to what you do now? That's a very interesting question. So when I was a medical student, we used to use this really long S-shaped incision that went from the lateral side all the way down uh, to the patella, could harvest the patella. And then we, um, we used the two incision technique. There was a special guide that you make from outside in and, and then the tibial side, just like we do now. So we started with that two incision technique and got pretty anatomic tunnels. And then we thought it was during my residency and into my fellowship, we thought that we could go transtibial and make a much more cosmetic incision. Little did we know that this cosmesis improvement was at the expense of ACL graft success. And the transtibial was non-anatomic. And so we, we, we blundered into that whole era, which lasted way too long, at least 10 years. 
we, we used to do a lot of augmentation and that got proven to be not essential. And here we are back now augmenting ACLs again. So what we've learned is things go full cycle and you need to always try to restore normal anatomy. And you need to also not be the first person to do something or the last. And you need to, to be open to new techniques and focus on lifelong learning. And nowhere is that more clear than an ACL world. Question from one of the PTs as far as how do they do better as far as quad strengthening prior to their leap testing? Well, uh, a lot because of the efforts of guys like you and gals like you. So the, the, the difference is that step test shows they have deficits. And so we really emphasize that and the therapists uh, jump on them literally and uh, it allows us to increase their strengths through uh, uh, closed chain exercises, uh, straight leg raise uh, and, and a variety of quadriceps strengthening that um, the improvements then are largely because of your efforts, and, and we appreciate that. So we have another question in the chat. It says, um, in the long term, we see poor quality of life in people with ACL reconstruction. What are we missing? Is it the rehab or the mechanics? Yeah, I, I think that it's very challenging for all of us as surgeons to think that we can uh, restore the precise anatomy that God has given us. And so uh, we're naive to think that we're as good as, as we can be. And so all I can say is we keep trying, we keep, tr you know, determining all these other factors like the need to augment uh, extra articular procedures, which we're starting to do again, uh, the need to get anatomic placement. Uh, and so we're all learning and we just got to keep learning for the benefits of our patients. And so I think the, the best thing we can do is just is keep trying to improve. Great stuff, Dr. Miller. Well, there are no other questions or we'll, uh, oh, yeah, we have just a thank you on the chat. So um, thanks, Dr. Miller. Um, excellent updated information. So um, we will try to keep doing these if you guys are interested. So um, I'll send more emails out. If you want to be off the email list, let, let me know. Otherwise, uh, we look forward to seeing you guys all again. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.